Campaign stop, Donald Trump stumps for votes in Baltimore. Controversial comments, Tim Kaine's brash prediction about church teaching on marriage. War on terror, the impact of serious ceasefire. And grave political crisis, Pope Francis challenges Catholics to build peace in Africa. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, September 12th, 2016. Good evening, thanks for joining us, I'm Brian Patrick. Donald Trump fires back at Hillary Clinton for calling half of his supporters a basket of deplorables. Jason Calvi is with the Trump campaign in Baltimore tonight. Jason? Brian, Donald Trump says Hillary Clinton's words reveal disdain for millions of American voters. He says that disqualifies her from public office. He made the comments here at the gathering of the National Guard Association. Hillary Clinton speaking to donors at a fundraiser in New York Friday. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Later, Clinton said she regretted her comments, but Trump says her choice of words was no accident. She divides people into baskets as though they were objects, not human beings. Trump says his campaign is about giving voice to the voiceless, representing forgotten men and women. While Hillary Clinton lives a sequestered life behind gates and walls and guards, she mocks and demeans hardworking Americans who only want their own families to enjoy a fraction of the security enjoyed by our politicians. And the Trump campaign is using Clinton's words in a new ad. You know what's deplorable? Hillary Clinton viciously demonizing hardworking people like you. The campaign is spending $2 million to run the ads in the battleground states of Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Florida. But Democrats are rallying around their nominee. And Marylanders will have an opportunity during his visit to see exactly why this election on national security and many other reasons uh, Hillary Clinton uh, should be elected president of the United States. While the question of the best choice for the White House is debated on the Baltimore streets outside Trump's speech, with Trump protesters, Donald Trump is on the wrong side of the right issues, and Trump supporters making their cases. Donald Trump says if Hillary Clinton doesn't retract her words in full, she can't credibly run for the White House. Donald Trump did tell this gathering of the National Guard Association that in his White House, they'll give them exactly what they need. He says right now, they're not currently receiving that. Brian? Jason Calvi with the Trump campaign in Baltimore. Thank you. And Trump addressed the Values Voters Summit Friday evening. He talked about cherishing and defending America's Christian heritage. The Republican nominee promises he'll appoint justices to the Supreme Court to defend religious liberty. He also supports school choice, including vouchers for students wishing to attend Catholic and other private schools. This could be a very a, a potentially valuable uh, policy for Trump to introduce into this election because he's making it possible for people who might be on the fence with him in the suburbs, those who are the working class, the blue collar workers, but especially Catholics who may be uncertain about his policies to pick something that they're really comfortable with, that they want to have. And I think Trump, by focusing on education reform, could form a bit of common ground with a lot of Catholics. Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and suffering from pneumonia, Hillary Clinton cancels plans to visit the West Coast this week. Video shows her wobbling and beginning to fall as she abruptly left a September 11th ceremony in New York. Clinton's doctor says the candidate became overheated and dehydrated. She appeared outside her daughter's apartment a couple of hours later saying she felt great. Clinton's doctor later revealed she has been diagnosed with pneumonia on Friday. Donald Trump has raised questions about Clinton's health. Today, though, he says there is no satisfaction in seeing her ill, adding, and this is a quote, I hope she gets well soon. Trump says he'll release the results of his new health exam shortly. Democratic vice presidential nominee Tim Kaine predicts the Catholic Church will eventually redefine marriage to include same-sex couples. His comment draws a swift, strong reaction from church leaders. 
Wyatt Goolsby has that story tonight. Brian, Senator Kane says he has changed his mind about marriage and says the church may follow suit one day. His comments come as the Clinton campaign tries to rally support among the gay community. Tim Kaine raised eyebrows Saturday night during his speech in Washington, predicting the Catholic Church will redefine marriage. Kane said, quote, I think it's going to change because my church also teaches me about a creator who, in the first chapter of Genesis, surveyed the entire world, including mankind, and said it is very good. Kane, who attends a Catholic church in Richmond, Virginia, went on to reference Pope Francis' now famous 2013 remark, who am I to judge? Amateur theologian alert. Monsignor Charles Pope, a pastor in the Archdiocese of Washington, says Kane's reference to the Bible is flawed. Genesis could not speak more clearly on marriage when it says fundamentally to us, male and female he created them. It says that this is why a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife and the two of them shall become one flesh. Monsignor Pope adds Kane's reference to Francis is taken out of context. Pope Francis was speaking very clearly about a, an individual who had a homosexual orientation but was living chastely, celibately. That's, if, he, if, if, if anyone, whatever their orientation, is living a holy life before God, we, we leave them to, to, to God's judgment. Despite pressure from the outside world, Monsignor Pope says the church will not change its position on marriage. The church has no authority whatsoever to redefine marriage. It's been given to us by God. We have no authority to change that definition. Even if we wanted to, we can't do it because it comes from God himself. Monsignor Pope also clarifying that the church is not against people who have a homosexual orientation, just that marriage is specifically the union between one man and one woman. Senator Kane admitted on Saturday that he was in favor of traditional marriage until he changed his mind in 2005. Brian. All right, Wyatt Goolsby, thank you. And other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Investigators believe a suspicious fire at a Florida mosque may be a hate crime. The St. Lucie County Sheriff's Department says surveillance video shows a man running away from the building, followed by a large flash. The Islamic Center of Fort Pierce was heavily damaged. That is the mosque Omar Mateen attended before killing dozens of people at an Orlando nightclub. President Obama meets with congressional leaders today. They're trying to end an impasse over a billion-dollar bill to fight the Zika virus. Democrats blocked the bill because it did not guarantee money for Planned Parenthood. The Philippines' new president wants American troops out of the southern part of his country. Rodrigo Duterte blames America for inflaming Muslim insurgencies in that region. President Obama recently refused to meet with Duterte after the Philippines' president cursed him. In the past... President Duterte has also cursed Pope Francis. Syria tries to implement a U.S.-Russian ceasefire agreement. It's still not clear if insurgent groups will abide by it. The week-long truce was preceded by more reports of violence. Syrian President Bashar Assad, in a rare public appearance, vows to take back land from the terrorists and rebuild his country. Assad traveled to a Damascus suburb now under government control after a four-year siege. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, the author of Defeating Jihad, The Winnable War is with us. Dr. Gorka, what is the point of the ceasefire and do you think it will hold? I think the point of the negotiators is to try and bring a modicum of stability uh, to the region, to this war that has killed between four and 500,000 people and potentially to allow the convoy of humanitarian aid into the war zone. What do you think it will take to actually bring an end to this long, bloody civil war? a uh, reality check for Washington and to understand that as long as Assad enjoys the support of both Vladimir Putin in Moscow and the government in Beijing, he's not going anywhere. Very interesting situation with the U.S. and Russia targeting ISIS in Syria. How can we team up with Russia against ISIS when we're really connected with different factions in the Syrian conflict? Again, uh, you need to have a dose of reality and understand that Russia isn't there really to target al-Nusra or jihadis. If you look at what they've been doing in the last year plus, they're mostly targeting anti-Assad forces. They're not there to fight jihadis. They're there to help support and maintain their client state, this dictator, uh, in power. I think uh, Russians know how to play a game and take us for a ride, and I think that's part of this current deal. So if terrorists are forced out of one region, won't they just set up shop somewhere else? 
Absolutely. This is the classic squeeze the balloon uh, scenario that in a region where national sovereignty doesn't really function, you have states that can't exercise control over their own territory, they can move. They'll move into Libya. They'll move into elsewhere. The National Counterterrorism Center of the United States recently briefed the president that ISIS already has what they call fully operational affiliates in 18 nations. This isn't just about Syria or Syria and Iraq. It is a much larger threat. In your book, The Winnable War, how do you suggest the war can be won? Yeah, my book, Defeating Jihad, The Winnable War, is, uh, has three very simple arguments. Number one, get politics out of the threat assessment. No more political correctness, no more distortion and censorship. Talk about the enemy as they talk about themselves, they're jihadists. Second, we really want the local Muslims who are suffering the most to be the face of this war, not white or brown-skinned Americans. We want to help the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Emiratis come together in a real co co uh, coalition, not the, the fake smoke and mirrors coalition we have now. And lastly, a lesson from the Cold War, we're going to to win not by counting body bags or killing as many terrorists as possible. Ultimate victory comes when we delegitimize their message. So we have to have a large counter-propaganda campaign to make jihad as a concept unpopular, the same way we did with communism during the Cold War. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, it's always good to have you with us. Thanks. Thank you so much. Coming up, a one-on-one -on -one with Ambassador David Saperstein, his push for international religious freedom and pro-life remembrance, how people are coming together in memory of aborted children. Pope Francis warns against divisions in the church. In his homily at morning mass at Casa Santa Marta today, the Holy Father says the devil wants to attack church unity, which he says is rooted in the Eucharist. The Pope asks all of us to pray for the church. Thank you for joining us this Monday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. A bipartisan resolution confronting ISIS genocide calls for the creation of a Nineveh Plain province in Iraq. Nebraska Representative Jeff Fortenberry introduced the House resolution. He hopes to restore the ancestral homeland of persecuted religious minorities. Rabbi David Saperstein, Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, joining us from the State Department. Ambassador, is this call for creating a Nineveh Plain province in Iraq realistic or purely symbolic? Well, it's aimed at providing uh, both an enhanced sense of governance um, for, a minor for minority groups that have often been shut out of governance and uh, uh, giving them some control over their own security. But it is not, uh, it, those are decisions in the end that the Iraqi people are going to have to make. Um, and the United States will be supportive of whatever the people of Iraq um, uh, felt that we wanted. We're concerned that, that regardless of the religious identity of the group, including all of those minorities on the Nineveh Plain, the Christian community, um, uh, the Shabbat community, the uh, Mandean, Sabian Mandean communities, um, that they all participate equally as citizens in controlling the future of the country um, and having uh, the ability to participate in the defense of their province so we do not have a repeat of what has happened in the past. Ambassador, how would you prioritize America's approach to addressing the persecution of these religious minorities in the Middle East with the Obama administration really winding down? You may just have a few months here. We do, and we're working very strongly with international um, uh, efforts to, uh, to kind of normalize um, the commitment to look past the fighting um, to determine what it will take uh, for, to allow the minority groups to return to their homes safely with hope for a future uh, that's economically sound, that it has security uh, degree um, steps that they can rely on. Um, and has some kind of accountability for the crimes against humanity um, that have taken place and some kind of uh, reconciliation and uh, transitional justice system um, uh, that those who were involved in supporting ISIL will be held accountable, those involved um, in, in solving disputes over property that now is held by others when they return, that all of that will be, um, will be resolved. Rabbi David Saperstein, Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Amid all the heartbreak for refugees, we have a story of hope tonight. A pregnant mom trying to flee North Africa gives birth on the Mediterranean Sea. Fortunately, she and the baby were picked up by a Doctors Without Borders rescue ship. The baby boy joins thousands of other immigrants 
or migrants, pulled from small, often overcrowded boats, were told he was given the name Newman or New Man. Pro-lifers visit grave sites and memorials Saturday for the National Day of Remembrance for Aborted Children, now in its fourth year. Services were held in more than 160 locations nationwide. The executive director of the Pro-Life Action League, Eric Scheidler, is co-director of National Day of Remembrance. He's joining us by Skype from suburban Chicago. And Eric, you helped to form this initiative. Why? Well, about four years ago, we realized that um, we were approaching a very important anniversary, the anniversary of a day that um, a th over a thousand babies were buried in, at a cemetery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And these babies had been recovered from a pathology lab where they were just sitting and rotting and a worker there alerted the pro-life community. They were saved from this uh, place. And then over the course of many months, they were solemnly buried all over the country, including a very important burial in Milwaukee. And as this anniversary was approaching, we decided to acknowledge the uh, efforts of pro-life activists over the years to bury these children and visit those graves. Many of them hadn't been visited in decades after those initial burials. And so we organized the National Day of Remembrance for Aborted Children in 2013. It was so well received, especially by people who have suffered through abortion themselves and the kind of healing and uh, the permission they got to mourn publicly for their children that we saw a need for making this an annual event. And so we've continued to hold this event and it's grown year by year. Describe what it means to people to actually visit, to have this experience of going to a grave site or a memorial for aborted children. Well, let me give the example of a woman who came out to a memorial service at Queen of Heaven Cemetery a couple of years ago. She had just found out a few days before the service that she had lost her first grandchild to abortion. This was uh, disclosed to her sort of by accident. She found out about it and had been trying to help her daughter along to kind of deal with the aftermath of this horrible choice she made. But coming to that service was a moment of real breakthrough for her. She was able to finally shed tears for this child, to mourn publicly for this child in a way that she hadn't been before. And I've seen that same experience repeated again and again, especially by parents who've chosen abortion. They come out to a service like this and they get to either tell their stories or hear someone else's story like theirs, and then finally shed tears for these children that they have such a horrible heartbreak over missing. And finally, how does prayer guide these visits? Well, prayer is really essential to everything we do in the pro-life movement. I think going out to a burial place or other memorial marker of aborted children really makes abortion real for you in a way that nothing else quite can. Being there with these uh, tiny bodies under your feet, thinking of what their lives would be like. In some cases, these children would have grown up and had children of their own. So you, you think about the whole generations of children that have been wiped out by one choice on one particular day. It makes it real for us. And really, I think, more than anything, uh, encourages us in our efforts to try to save these children. It makes it real in a way that I think is essential for people to experience. Eric Scheidler, Pro-Life Action League, joining us by Skype from Aurora, Illinois. Eric, thank you. Thank you. Up next, the Vatican's plan for protecting children from abuse. A tough choice, we meet the football coach forced to choose between prayer and his job. Pope Francis offers prayers for the West African nation of Gabon. He says the former French colony faces a grave political crisis. During his Sunday Angelus address, Francis says Catholics should be builders of peace. Thank you for joining us this 12th of September. I'm Brian Patrick. Members of the Pope's panel to protect minors can now address Vatican groups and train bishops. Catherine Zeltner spoke today with Commission member Kathleen McCormick, who's just finishing a week-long meeting at the Vatican. Kathleen, what was the focus of this meeting? The focus of this meeting this time was reporting back on our work groups that we have in place on education, on formation, on guidelines, and it really is, and also looking at setting up our website so that we can really relate to the whole world and people can ask questions of us. And the other thing is we meet here every six months, but the work just doesn't happen at the plenary. We work all the time between meetings. What feedback or directives are you getting from Pope Francis about your work? The feedback we're getting um, from Pope Francis is extremely positive because through Cardinal O'Malley he reports to Pope Francis and Pope Francis has already put the document out, Loving Mother, which is really looking at the accountability of bishops. 
So we think that's wonderful feedback. And the other thing is the day of prayer that was requested by a victim to help with the healing of victims. And that has already gone out from the Holy Father to the world and it's already been, some countries have already taken it up. So we, we feel, we experience the Holy Father's been very receptive to us. Kathleen, some victims feel like they are not being heard or assisted by the church. What are you doing to address their concerns? With the victims, as you would understand, Catherine, our role is not to work with the victims. Our role is about policy and procedures for the future, about really safe guidelines so that ch the child protection, that abuse never happens again. So if a victim does come forward to us, we send them to the, to the country where they come from and to make sure it goes to the proper authorities. But it's not our role to work with the victims. Our role is for the future. Kathleen, thank you for your work for the church and for our children. Kathleen McCormack, Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors. Thank you, Catherine. The U.S. Military Academy removes a video clip of Army's football team praying together after an upset win over Temple Friday night. A group called the Military Religious Freedom Foundation claims team prayer violates the players' religious freedom. A West Point spokesman says the video, which was posted on social media, was removed pending an inquiry. That same group questioned the Air Force Academy football team kneeling in prayer prior to games last year. The Academy found that practice was within regulations. High school football coach Joe Kennedy, who lost his job for praying after games, spoke at the recent Values Voter Summit. He talked with our chief White House correspondent and political director Lauren Ashburn. We're joined now by Joe Kennedy. He's a former football coach at Bremerton High School in Washington State. Joe, welcome to the program. Thank you. You and the First Liberty Institute filed a lawsuit against the school district last month, and you say that your First Amendment rights were violated. Take me back. What happened? How long have you been praying? I know this is all about faith. Right. Uh, after every game, I always took a knee, and for you know, 15, 20, maybe 30 seconds of giving thanks uh, for what the kids just did on the field. And after all these years, uh, the school finally got a compliment from one of the districts and said, hey, what the football program's doing is awesome. So they actually started an investigation and it led me to where we are today where the school said you could choose between your faith or your job. And I stood up for my faith and uh, for the Constitution. And lost your job. Yes, ultimately I did. Now, last October, the school district uh, suspended you, they fired you, and now you don't have that job. You're still working for the, for the government. But why do you think that this suddenly became an issue now? You've been doing this for seven years. Yeah, I wish I had a really good answer of why. Uh, I, I just see more and more things popping up in the news every day that uh, all of our freedoms in the Constitution really is, doesn't mean anything anymore today. So I, I don't know why today, but somebody's got to stand up and say enough is enough. And at the Values Voters Conference, where you are right now, have you been inspired to continue your mission? Oh, absolutely. There's some incredible people that are here. I, I hear these stories of, of people and they're saying that I'm, I inspire them. My goodness, these people inspire me. They're incredible. And you're going to continue this fight, it seems, with First Liberty Institute. You're waiting for a court date. We'll check back in with you once you get one, once you, you have a trial. Joe Kennedy, former football coach in Bremerton, Washington. Thank you. Thank you. A conversation from Friday. Grateful we could share it with you tonight. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick, and we leave you tonight revisiting Saturday's Jubilee Papal audience in St. Peter's Square. Pope Francis preached on God's redemption for all of us, all God's children.